to date with what's going on, please let us know. Now, those are live events. We also have about once a week we have a webinar um, through the through the sort of winter and into the spring. We tend to uh, relax off a little bit with the webinars in the summer because people want to be gardening. But we've got some fabulous ones coming up in the next couple of weeks. So Claire Greenslade, who is the head gardener at Hestercombe in Somerset, is going to be doing a webinar about um, about whether art, well, gardening is an art form, which I think we all agree is. But it'll be interesting to hear Claire's um, take on that. We've also got a webinar with a fabulous uh, woman photographer, garden photographer called Eva Nemeth. Um, she's going to be doing her her um, sort of how to take photographs like her and they are most beautiful photographs and then we come over to North America and we're going to be at Far Reaches up on the west coast um, with Kelly and Sue uh, talking about woodlanders extraordinary unusual woodlanders I've had the great pleasure of actually visiting Far Reaches and I was blown away it's just the most incredible nursery so um, you know do even if you're not over in the states and you're in the in in Europe do um, uh, join us for that because, of course, you know, their climate and our climate's not that different. And a lot of the plants that they've got are really, really, well, not just noteworthy, absolutely brilliant. And then we've got a uh, wonderful uh, webinar with Roy Diblick, uh, who needs no introduction. He's a horticultural um, hero. We will be going back to Chanticleer with Chris Fellhaber, who does a seasonal um, talk about what's happening at Chanticleer. And um, just also to remind you that we we are sort of into our uh, season or our, our series of talks on bad botany with Caroline Jackson, but it's not too late if you want to join up. Now, again, I've only just that's only what, what's happening in the next couple of weeks. So, you know, it, have a look at the um, webinar section on the website. And if you can't make them because of time zone or any of your, you know, uh, other commitments, then you can also watch the webinars as recorded webinars, pay to view whenever you want to. Occasionally, there might be one that we won't record. Um, but more often than not, they are on the recorded uh, webinar page. So lots to look at. Do have a little look through. Uh, it doesn't matter where you live in the world. Um, there's there's something there for everybody. But there's also, you know, whatever time zone you are, you can access all this information. So, you know, we've 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 gathered together a lot over the last few years and we continue. So um, come and come and join us. You can also become a member, which means you get discounts on wonderful discounts on on live events and webinars and special offers we have a retail page as well so you know um do do have a look do explore we'd love to hear from you and email us if you've got any questions that's the that's the most important thing so hopefully that will have um got some of you interested in what we're all about and i'm going to hand over to noel who's going to introduce our guest tonight thank you thank you annie um so this evening i'm delighted to have margaret roche who we have been sort of in contact with for, I think, over a year now. Um, Margaret interviewed us uh, for her podcast about, a, I think, more than a year ago. And since then, we've been trying to pin her down, but she's a busy girl, so it's been a bit difficult. So we're delighted to have her. Um, now, I'm sure most of this audience actually know her, but for those who don't, uh, Margaret has a, a website called Away, Away to Garden, which is a wonderful portal I suppose is the word and there seems to be so much on there um about many aspects of gardening um I mean Margaret could you perhaps just sort of in a nutshell describe what you're trying to do with the with the website uh, yeah I mean it started out as a blog a gardening blog back in the day 15 or 17 years ago or whatever and um at first it was just me posting about you know how to grow a tomato and what perennials to use for ground covering and so on and so forth. And then it became um, maybe 14 years ago, the pot with the podcast became interviewing other people about every kind of topic possible from sort of more scientific and nature to garden design to, you know, plant pathology and pests and this and that and the other thing. And so it's that now those are the blog posts and so forth. So it's a wide mm -hmm. range that reflect all my interests, which are diverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did you get into plants and gardening in the first place? <laughs> how did I start gardening? It, um, I've told the story a lot of times, so if anyone knows me, they'll be bored. But I'll say it again. The short version is when I was 24, my father 
died. And the next year, my mother, who was 49 at the time, got early onset Alzheimer's disease. And I was the oldest child and there was nobody else to do anything. So I was put in charge of it, um, the situation. And I had to move home and uh, I got a job working at the New York Times at night as a copy editor. And during the days I was kind of on duty in the household caring for her. Well, it was pretty depressing. And so I started digging holes in the front yard and the backyard and the side yard. And I cut down the privet hedge that surrounded the property and so on and so on. And you know how that goes. It's addictive. And so it was my horticultural therapy sort of need, I think. Um, that it fulfilled and it went from there um, <laughs> and I eventually took you know some classes at New York Botanical Garden things like that but nothing formal I had no formal education and I really was lucky to um, to be offered an opportunity at a newspaper a Newsday newspaper in Long Island many many years ago to uh, to write about it and um, by interviewing experts like you guys, um, I got tutored, so to speak, over the years. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, you're, you're muted. Yeah, you're on mute now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I remember you telling me that you went through quite a phase of of, of buying plants in small pots through the post from the likes of Dan Hinckley and Tony Avent. Oh. Something, something of a collector. Uh, yeah. I mean, do you collect plants now, or do you feel that's a phase that you've you've moved beyond? Um, <clears throat> I look at, I still look at all the lists and so forth, and and I crave some of the things, um, mm. but I don't I don't buy shop and order as many you know for as many things as I used to. Definitely not. Um, you know, and those were the days when some rarity would come, you know, with a little plastic bag around its roots and it was six mm -hmm. feet, six inches tall. And some of those things are now, you know, 30 feet tall, obviously, in the garden here, you know, and they were this rooted cutting or this grafted little creature, you know, that I could hold in the palm of my hand. And so, um, yeah, that was a different age and I was a different age. So I don't I don't buy as much. I'm trying to make myself um evict the naughty ones i'm trying to spend time on that <laughs> the ones that have um, outworn their welcome for being thugs mm -hmm. and i'm trying to be judicious about what i do adopt right um, yes yes yeah. um how how well, how big is the space you garden and i think we, we need to get yeah. a, a, a vision of that before we try mm -hmm. to start to talk about garden thugs which yeah it's 2.3 acres mm. it's on a steep hillside in a rural place um where the states of connecticut massachusetts and new york come together on the new york side so a very hilly place yeah. um <clears throat> you know the cold winter and so forth and um it's surrounded by seven thousand acres of state forest mm. so it looks like it's much bigger than it is but I do have a deer fence, an eight foot deer fence around the 2.3 acres, because yes. otherwise there'd be no plants. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> we have herds of deer, you know, you see 45 animals at a time in the field across yes. the street. So, you know, it's, yes. it's, and they are big deer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they are very tame deer, in my experience. And in they will experience. nibble on anything. They will yes. taste, they will take a taste of anything. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Makes our makes our wild boar seem quite a quite a minor problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, so uh, back in the 90s, you did a book with Ken Drews, The Natural Habitat Garden, which mm. um, I very definitely remember that coming out. Um, um, and that was, yeah, that was a very different time, really, in, in, yes. in gardening. Um, and how would you how would you describe that time? Mid nineties? <clears throat> well, I think it was that book was a little bit kind of ahead of mm what's going on now maybe, but it reflected both of our interests mm -hmm. in sort of more habitat style gardening and in native plants. We were both lucky to live you know, only a couple of hours away from what was then called the New England Wildflower Society and to have mm -hmm. really benefited from seeing um, their gardens there and the, the plants there and realizing, you know, how many beautiful things there were and, and, and just kind of 
digging into that subject matter. But we went all over the country and we met gardeners who were doing that in the desert and in, you know, the, the Pacific Northwest and in the Midwest and all over the place who were doing habitat style gardening. Um, it was definitely in contrast, though, to what you asked me about before, and I probably didn't answer thoroughly, the collector ethic of mm -hmm. my younger years as a gardener, where it was like, ooh, ooh, it's new, it's rare, I've got to have it. Some plant explorer just found it in Nepal or on the mountain in, you know, wherever, and I've got to have that, I've got to have that. Ooh, there's a variegated form of blah, blah, I've got to have that too, you know. And that was the ethic and that was the, the 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 passion was to get the newest and the latest and that i think ken and i both from that moment on really started to have to reckon you know this is like 30 years <laughs> reckon with um the pull between those the push and pull between those two desires those two drives right do you go for the variegated something or other from china or do you go for the native habitat style sustaining you know um, diversity promoting um native thing and yeah so i definitely have both instincts but mm -hmm. i have a collectory kind of garden right around the house very tightly around the house i allow myself my old favorite treasures little treasures as i walk up the front walk but mm -hmm. most of the places is, is is more you know shrubberies big 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 shrubberies and right. um, yeah mm -hmm. yeah uh so plenty of habitat in other words um because then one of the things you really want to stress is that you became interested in in birds and, and wildlife yeah. some considerable time ago and that actually has gone that interest has gone very much in concert with your with your gardening yeah <clears throat> i i really i often say that i think that like birds taught me to garden because <clears throat> um when i was first here it wasn't a garden the place that i bought it was a little old 18 80s house <clears throat> kind of in a field you know like on a hillside and um there was no discernible garden a couple of shrubs here and there and uh, i would be out kind of starting to make the first beds that i was trying to make and um and i would see these birds that i grew up in new york city I grew up in Queens County in New York City and you know I, I knew certain birds but I didn't know the birds I was seeing here in this place and um, so I became fascinated by them and I started reading about them you know field guides and so forth and and noticing what they liked and what they were doing and and so forth and um, and that sort of then I tried to distill from there and figure out what they would like and thankfully, right away, I put in a couple of in-ground water gardens that if you want to know what the best plant is for birds, it's water. <laughs> That's definitely going to attract the most species of anything at all. Um, so I see you're showing the slides and um, like, the place came with five old apple trees. They're about 150 years old and I've underplanted them and so forth. <clears throat> um, that's a moment that'll be coming up in about six or eight weeks or so, I guess. Um, and, you know, I don't really hang out in the garden very much. I have a table and some chairs outside, but I don't ever sit out there. But I like to look out the window and see the shapes and the dimensions of the garden. You know, that for me is like to view it from inside out is, is what it's about for me, that and then the habitat and the farther reaches uh, for the birds and other animals. Um, there's one of the in-ground water gardens uh, behind the house, one of the, it's the larger of them. And it's just amazing the number of animals, especially birds. I have about 70 species of birds that visit the garden regularly each year that I can count on and then accidental ones as well. And, and the water is a big reason. And then a lot of shrubs, like we have a lot of winterberry holly and a lot of other fruit bearing shrubs that are important. Um, that was the beginning of my first meadow up on the hillside, a uh, little blue stem, one of our native prairie grasses, a lot of go golden rods and so forth. And now it's much bigger, um, much less mowing and much more um, undergrowth. And there's that pond again. 
Um, but, you know, speaking to the collector thing, I'm still crazy about, there's a lot of Asian plants here in my garden. And, you know, I, I love some of the angelicas like Egas, this one, and, you know, so do the insects, <laughs> all those umbels, right? Um, so, yeah, anyway. Yeah, yes. So, uh, so quite a quite an in, quite an international blend then. Um, yes, I mean yes. those of us who've been sort of following <laughs> this extraordinary growth of interest in growing Native American plants, which in my case I think I can sort of date back to probably to nineteen ninety two. Um, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I, I, I certainly remember various, various occasions when there's quite a bit of of, of controversy, shall we shall we say? Um, yeah. And I remember some other sort of bad-tempered spat between James Van Sweden and and, and Ken Druce. Um, yes. James Van Sweden being someone I sort of hung out with on a few occasions in, yeah, yeah. in, in those years. I mean, do, do you feel that 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 <clears throat> controversy is largely heals now? But you've, we've all gone beyond that. Do I do I feel there's still. Do you, do you still feel there's 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 a kind of an argument there, or do you feel everyone's moved moved on beyond those those disputes between those who are plant only natives and and uh, those who are much more pragmatic, perhaps you could say more traditional horticulturalists? Oh no, I think it's I think it's reached uh, the most intense conflict point of all that I've oh, ever seen. Oh, do you? Seen. Oh, do you? Oh. <clears throat> and I, and and I say that my data point would be um, the comments section of the New York Times columns that I've been doing the last four years oh, really? and my own website and the many, 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 many emails and so forth I get from people. If I write about anything non-native, mm -hmm. the number of comments that yell in, in whatever words <laughs> yes. at me is, is quite high. And um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, tension, uh, definitely. Oh dear, I'm sorry to hear that. It's because I was rather under the impression that um, perhaps because perhaps because I haven't actually set foot in the United States for a few years. It's actually since yeah. before COVID. So um, we seem to be yeah. having controversy about everything. <laughs> yeah, here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's just another reflection of the the polarized times. Um, um, anyway. Um, on the subject of of well, you you, you mentioned earlier, you know, New New York. Um, I and mean, the High Line has obviously been uh, the most <clears> enormous <throat> success, and somewhere I feel very privileged to have been right in on the beginning of when I knowing Pete when he, it was first kind of mooted, and then meeting him, you know, in a, when it was a hard hatted construction site and all the rest of it. Um, what's your take on what the High Line has has done for? The gardening for nature amongst New Yorkers. Oh, I, I think it's been very, very, very instructive. I think it's, I think it's been the first aha for so many urban people. You know, to say, oh, you know, this is completely different. You know, because of course, all they'd either seen before that was like bedding schemes or containers. You know, full of decorative, you know, an orientation, um, or just trees in some cases. You know, they hadn't seen you know, street trees and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. So no, it's it's uh, people are uh, very 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 uh, attached to it, and and it's it's mm -hmm. very loved. I think so. I, th I think it's been an eye opener for people, um, very positive. Um, and, and, and do you think it's helped change the way people garden? I'm sure there's trickle down from from all efforts like that, but I don't. Um, I mean, I don't know. Like again, I don't have a sort of data point <laughs> to um you know to, to to share exactly i don't i don't i don't know exactly but it certainly gets a lot of visitors um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and you know then what happens is when you have a place like that <clears throat> in a city like that then there'll be programming as well like educational programming say at various botanical institutions or whatever or the libraries or what whatever that that speak to the subject matter like it becomes a subject within that community mm -hmm. and there's more teaching about it and the people involved may come and give a talk and so on and so on and so on and, and you both know that from having mm -hmm. you know been invited to do that um in places where you've done work you know so it ripples out from such an installation i think mm -hmm. you know? 
So, yeah, I mean, certainly my experience of it, it was just wonderful to see people. You almost often feel people are taking notice of plants almost like the first time in their their lives. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, have there been other? Because I know there's been a much talk of, of of other projects that try to emulate what the Highline has done in other cities. I mean, how how have they progressed? I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I don't. I can't say that I necessarily keep up no. with um, uh, um, uh, Thomas Trainer and Claudia West, for instance. Phyto Design have been doing a lot of projects in different places, frequently at public institutions, and those have gotten really good reception. And they mm -hmm. also, again, are out educating. I think speaking a lot and so forth. Um, so, I mean, I, there are definitely more and more such projects mm -hmm. where there's a message um, and by the way their work for example doesn't say it has to be all native or no, 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 yeah, right yeah. you know yeah. so <clears throat> and they're and they're they're happy to talk about that and they can yeah. explain mm -hmm. their rationale and so forth and so i think that's good i think to have mm -hmm. that kind of yeah. communication yeah. with people who have this hands-on expertise and a, a, a demonstrated um, record of performance, you know, I think mm. that's really positive. But I think mm. it's going to take a long time. I mean, look, one of the biggest issues we have here um, is the screaming and yelling about the lawns, that everybody still wants to keep their lawns. And, you know, it, 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 the despite all the no mo um, suggested programs and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of animosity between neighbors in in you know neighborhoods um, about whether or not lawn is a thing of the present and the future or a thing of the past. And you know, mm -hmm. how can we live without our beautiful lawns? So <clears throat> we have a lot of again a lot of conflict points. I think within if we want to call it horticulture. I mean. That's really turf grass culture, but, <laughs> but yeah. I can imagine. I mean, I can imagine the whole lawn dispute actually something oh. becoming very much mirroring the, the 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 polarity we see in U.S. politics. It's <laughs> it it's it, it's almost identical. Yes, yeah, yes, really. yes, 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 and, yes. But and and any time I write about alternatives to lawn, I get. <clears throat> screamed at again screaming in quotes because they're commenting typing mm -hmm. a comment mm -hmm. i get screamed at about um that their homeowners association or their community or their local government forbids it that their neighbors wouldn't put up with it that they will get tick-borne diseases we have a lot of different species mm -hmm. of ticks here yeah. and a lot of tick-borne diseases that they equate the only way to protect themselves from tick disease is to mow, they feel, and be in a, a, a clipped grass environment. Mm -hmm. And um, and that their children won't have anywhere to play. So yeah. those are the, you know, the screaming kind of comments. And and of course, all of those could be worked around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could have a nice area for playing, and it's not true that you won't see a tick on turf grass, and it's Anyway, lots lots of things could be done to make all of that okay, and yeah, you could be yeah. vigilant about checking yourself for ticks. That would be another possibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, and uh, you spend a certain amount of time in your garden at night with the moths. I understand. Oh yeah, I know. I was just, sorry the slides went by because those would be good to show to people and explain. Mm. Um, I put a few pictures in. <clears throat> excuse me just i don't know if you can back up or that's that's one guy i don't remember if let's see if if you back up a couple of slides i'll see where i am if you're able to back up or maybe it's on slideshow it's so, on it's on a or it's on a loop so they'll, they'll oh they'll, they'll <clears throat> well that thing on the right is not a twig the part on the right is actually um a stick caterpillar uh, oh, wow. yeah. a caterpillar of a moth and um, disguising himself so that he doesn't get eaten while he's busy eating. I'm crazy about lichen. I, I, I seem to be very good at growing lichen, including on the furniture. Um, mm -hmm. 
but uh, it's fascinating. I couldn't resist letting this just happen, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so we, it turns out I have three species of lichen moths, lichen specific moths in my habitat, including the painted lichen moth who's quite pretty. Um, so yeah, moths are a big deal. And I think a lot of us never go into our gardens at night other than to maybe have supper on the patio. And there's this whole after hours, um, this whole after hours, uh, you know, crew out there, all kinds of other creatures. And they're so important to the biodiversity and to the functioning of the, <clears throat> of the um, ecosystem that uh, I think it's really important to kind of go outside and, um, and see what's going on out there. That's my oldest, those are my oldest plants, actually, the clivias of my grandmother's. I know that they're, they're not, um, I inherited her clivias anyway. On the subject of lichens, I was oh, yeah. having a tour around a tree nursery yesterday and um, we were looking at some Celtis australis, which is, um, very, well, Celtis is the hack, hackberry genus. Um, and uh, the nursery chappy was pointing out, oh, look at all those yellow lichen. And it was very, really true, the, the bark. And these were quite young trees, and they were um, yeah. Yeah. Um, covered in the, in the bright yellow lichen, which normally you don't see, you'd more likely see that on stone than on bark. And I thought, well, I'd better start looking at, you know, what lichens I see on what bark. But it's very, he says it, it is so much a feature of, 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 of Celsius. It's actually one of the interesting right. either thing. Uh, is that something you've noticed at all? Well, I mean, there, there are, I'm not lichens. going to be able to remember, you know, there's crustose ones that are on hard surfaces like rocks. And there's, I can't remember the three categories of, of lichen, but yes there are specific there's specific classes you know some grow on wood or on the ground or on rock <clears throat> different ones do and then yes you're right there also i think there are some specific relationships yeah, within yeah. those categories but yeah. and then again like certain um animals including those moths uh that have a relationship with the lichen as well so it's 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 so intricate and intimate and that's the part that i really love about the garden, you know, you're asking about, you know, collector garden, habitat garden, native plant garden. My interests have gone from that collector passion of my early days to much more of <clears throat> like, it's a little bit of a science lab out there for me too. Mm -hmm. And I want to know why everything and what's that and how come and, mm -hmm. you know, um, so I, I love that part of it. Yeah, yeah. And do, do, do you record species that crop up, turn, turn out? Yes. I recorded over 200 species of moths here in the wow. garden. Yeah, there's yeah, probably yeah. 1,200 in my county, so it's not that yeah. many really to do 200. But I'm a layperson, so I, I and I only do it occasionally. You know, you have yeah, to yeah. turn on a light at night and be outside, and and yes, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's but it's it's kind of yeah, it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you you describe the garden as mostly shrubs, um, presumably with intervening grassland of some kind. Uh, how do you yes. I mean, what, what what are your kind of management or beyond the kind of more intimate garden around the house? What what are the sort of management techniques you have to use to keep everything varied and biodiverse? And... Well, there's a lot of pruning, obviously, because there's a lot of woody plants. <clears throat> Um, and then there's, in the oldest areas, what I, what I did was early on, I kind of came back in from the fence line, maybe 20 to 30 feet in some cases, and made these big, big shrubberies to create more edge habitat for the birds. So, mm -hmm. you know, very, very deep beds of big numbers of shrubs and, and trees as well combined, so that the turf doesn't extend all the way out to the property line and instead right. i'm creating you know that from the woodland edge the natural woodland edge of the forest the park or the state land i'm kind of creating you know again like this edge like this um this other these other layers adjacent to it that are maybe again the first 20 or so feet deep of my property and those are all lots and lots of flowering and fruiting shrubs and mixed in with conifers, mixed in with vines, 
underplanted. Um, early on, I didn't know what to underplant with. I have a lot of big root geranium, geranium macrorhizum. Thankfully, it doesn't turn out to be a hideous invasive or anything. It's easy to get rid of. Um, so that's okay. Nowadays, I use our native um, ginger, Acerum canadense, and Tiarellas and other native things when I'm redoing a bed, you know, I use native ground covers instead, but I try to have a thick ground cover so that mm -hmm. I don't have a full time staff or anything. So it has Perish to be the thought of all the gardeners. <laughs> yes, all in a little yeah. uniform. <laughs> yeah, I know it has to be, you know, what I mean, some of these big shrubberies have to be a little bit like self managing, you know, where you don't have to intervene too much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But Barbara, there's a lot of them around the place. I mean, there's four that are just large numbers of winterberry holly, yeah. for instance, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, on different sight lines from the house so that I can enjoy them too before the birds take all the berries. Uh -huh. right. yeah, yeah. Margaret, I was going to ask if you were going to if you move going to move tomorrow and you could take an armful of plants from your current garden, you know, mm -hmm. just a limited selection. Which ones would you? Be out there digging up that you had to take with you you couldn't live without well <clears throat> actually well from the house plant department i would just take my grandmother's clivia which now are probably 80 years old or so um there's lots of them now there used to just be one when when she was still alive mm. <clears throat> but um the next picture or the one after that my japanese umbrella pine which was the first thing i planted here that that's it a few years ago and then there's another picture of it as well um you know i couldn't possibly dig it up but i'd have to get another one um, yeah i'm so attached to that plant it's weird that as a non i mean i was i knew nothing about gardening and yet i bought a japanese umbrella pine oh. <laughs> at a rare plant nursery there it is in the winter yeah so, yeah <clears throat> i don't know what would i dig up um I have a plant called Chloranthus japonicus, which uh -huh. is a woodland plant from Asia. Um, it's still kind of unusual and I like it very much and I'd probably want to take a piece of that. Uh -huh. That's the nicest of the old five old apples. That's amazing, amazing. And yeah. it fruits heavily. So. Does it? I was, going to, I was going to say such huge old trees and they do fruit very well. Yeah, it's That's about amazing. 35 amazing. feet across. Beautiful shape. Yeah, takes a lot of pruning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and they, they... and and in your opinion, Margaret, in terms of exciting gardens over there in the states that um, that you've discovered in you know in the last few years, I mean, is there anything that you can sort of tip us off that this is the garden to watch or these are the people to watch? Who 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 is who's kind of you know going to be stealing the show in the next few years? Do you think? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know. Um... I mean, you, the places I still turn and ask a lot of questions and get a lot of inspiration, you know about them, like you talked about Chanticleer and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. I think um, the team at Untermeyer in Yonkers in New York, they've only been at it for 10 years, transforming okay. a historic estate that had been left to go to ruin. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty incredible what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. So that's been fun to see, and they're getting enormous amount of visitors, uh, which is great because to have people in that area getting to see free of charge, by the way, just to come mm. in um, and, and, and be inspired. I hope that's going to spawn a lot, a new crop of gardeners, you know, mm. Mm. Um, but hmm. I, I don't know. I'd have to think. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you caught me off guard. Yeah, oh, that's okay. Now I, I just wondered if you yeah. had any insights into, or, or you know, special ones that you really feel. <laughs> well, like. I mean, maybe Stonely. Stonely. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's kind of on our list, isn't it? Yes, we must get Ethan on actually. Yes. Yeah, yes. he's very good, and yeah. I, I, I think they've they're taking an again a historic estate, but mm. being given a native only mandate, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a formal setting. And using natives and he's so creative mm. I mean, yeah, it sounds like we must yeah yeah we must try no it is it's it's extraordinary yeah. his his uh just you know <clears throat> an exciting garden and, and he has yeah. got a great team yeah. there yeah a lot of energy mm -hmm. yeah. he's great yeah yeah 
Um, and in terms of demographics, I mean, I always had the impression that gardening in the States was pretty much a, a white activity. Um, then I chanced across the black, the black flower farmers who we're going to be having on our show in just a, by the end of the month. And so I'm just wondering, is, is there a sort of more of a greater diversity amongst the garden crowd now? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I don't I don't know. I don't want to I, I don't want to act as if I know the percentages or whatever, but mm. I definitely um, in the seed, in, in our seed company sort of movement, our organic seed movement, there's a lot of really important figures, but there have always been, they just haven't necessarily been as well known. Um, you know, some of the longtime leaders in the organic seed movement here, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. are women of color and, um, and, um, and, and so, there's a whole new group of younger generation uh, seed farmers and so forth. So that's really promising to me because it all comes from seed. <laughs> a lot mm -hmm. of it comes from seed. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm seeing much more emphasis because more space is being given, thankfully, to speaking about and showcasing um, these creators. But... I think they were always there and they were always gardening and loving plants and and growing food and you know doing these things i don't i don't think yeah anyway yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. somebody's asking margaret what the tree is near your porch um it's obviously not up at the moment but the, a, a picture has gone by what's the tree beside uh, margaret's house near the porch there by the way is one of the big shrubberies that's probably you know, 15 or 20 feet deep with trees and mm. shrubs and so forth. That's on one end of the property. Mm. Um, the tree in the beginning was the Cyadopitus, the Japanese umbrella pine. <clears throat> there was an apple tree as well. Mm. Um, this is a, a for the to benefit the birds and other animals. I don't take down dead and dying trees. I try to turn them into snags or wildlife trees and let everyone have at them. Mm -hmm. So if the canopy is falling off, I cut some of it off and stabilize them for a while and get another five or 10 years out of them. Mm. Um, so. And do you find having, you know, a really good um, range of, of, of birds coming <laughs> into the garden that that, you know, is, is, is a really good natural sort of biodiversity. You've got a good pest control. <laughs> you don't have um, problems that the birds are going to predate on certain things. So does that, do you find that that makes a big difference? Well, that's the idea. By the way, there's a pretty great moth, mm. Pandora Sphinx. Um, yeah, th that's the idea, right? Is that if you leave, if you leave the food chain intact, or if it has been disrupted, which of course it has been everywhere, if you do your best to support it, to nourish it, to mm. uh, not hurt it, <laughs> yeah, not use chemicals. Obviously, I've been an organic gardener for my whole life. Um, and plant diversely to, 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 to put to, to in any way you can restore pieces of the food chain that are missing. And mm. um, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I think that's true. I don't, I can't say that I have um, pest and disease problems mm. beyond the ones that there's nothing that you can do about it because there is no predatory creature in the food chain even naturally mm -hmm. because of their an invasive imported pest yeah so you know we we've lost in the northeast we've lost most of our hemlocks to the woolly adelgid um you know these are things that you can't no matter how diversely you plant there's no there's nothing to do you know yeah yeah um, but yes and, yeah and you were talking about the deer fence did you put that up very you know a long time ago in the early days or did you did you sort of get around to thinking you know i've got to i've got to do it how, how long have you had that in place i was <clears throat> i was a weekend gardener the first maybe 20 years i was here and i don't know maybe eight or so years in maybe even 10. i just got so tired of showing up on friday night or saturday morning and seeing another viburnum chomp to the ground or you know what I mean a limb missing mm. because they weren't just munching the head off a herbaceous thing that would grow back 
they were disfiguring years of investment in woody plants and that's what i couldn't take you know that drove me wild <laughs> yeah. so yeah that's my chore list <laughs> yeah yeah no it's great I anybody think else got a chore list <laughs> I, I think everyone's got a list of lists i think a lot of people over here in the uk i don't think they quite realize the problem that deer are i mean people in mm. The rural UK sort of say, yeah, well, there's deer and there's rabbits and there's badgers. But, you know, right, right, I, right. I know what it's like, you know, seeing herds of deer walking through the suburbs in the States. I mean, they're like yes. they're like kind of hooded gangs, you know, walking around demolishing gardens. I mean, it's quite it's quite bad, isn't it? It is. It's hmm. it's it's very bad um, because we the way we have managed them and the way we have. um pushed them into, in, can you say, increasingly smaller territories? Yeah, <laughs> can you increase yeah, something yeah. to make it small? smaller, smaller, smaller by our development of, of more and more and more of their former territories? Uh, you know, we've made it impossible. And so they are, yeah, they don't have like a, a place to go. Yeah. And we've also allowed the populations to get massive relative yeah. to the yeah. amount of sustenance available yeah so a suburban yard looks really delicious when you don't yeah. have open natural lands remaining mm. anymore, right? yeah 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 but we've lost our in 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 a lot of this country and especially in the northeast we've lost because of herds of deer we've lost our um herbaceous layer of our forests we don't have all those except in the most special remote places we don't have you know the trilliums and the dutchman's breeches and the this and the that we don't have the um other than ferns that they don't mm. like to eat mm. you don't see the herbaceous layer anymore it's a bare forest floor yeah um Gosh, there's, there's, even, there's even a note in the chat box jeanette cole saying i can see 10 deer out of the window right now <laughs> yes just, yeah yes. so is there no um form of control i mean do, do the i mean i know that every state is probably different but you know this must be a recognized problem and so is, is there no kind of do, do any any of the states kind of put anything together and 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 try and control these deer or not i think <clears throat> i think all of them do but i don't think that they, each one has a, a policy or whatever mm, mm. but it's yeah it doesn't seem to be yeah uh, working yeah <laughs> and now there there is the tree against the porch the flowering tree it looks like a fruit tree is it there oh. was there was a tree okay. um a, a right up against the house i think that oh was. i'm sorry yeah it's an espalier asian pear right okay oh, a nashi pear mm. Mm. Right. yeah and it's nice i like it even when it's naked in the winter you know just with its arms outstretched mm -hmm. it's just a nice kind of a sculpture yeah mm, mm, lovely. yeah sorry I didn't I I forgot that picture yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. thank you well there's lots of lovely comments in the chat box and I'm, I'm not seeing any particular questions if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Margaret I mean there's lots and lots of wonderful comments um somebody is, has mentioned Nancy Sutton saying there's a free there's a weekly free midweek program at 3 p.m eastern time 30 minutes to the hour on is it JC Ralston Arboretum's website <clears throat> yes um, advocates the alternatives to lawn so anybody who's um able to tune into that that sounds quite interesting there certainly was quite a a move to using carex species uh yes like carex pensylvanica um i mean how how's that going i mean i, I can imagine probably not not that she um well walk on or sunbathe on but in, in many places it, i would have thought that would be really rather successful so the the largest trial that i know of comparing yes. All the Carex species was completed last year at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware. Right. Yes, yes. And in their trial gardens, and it was many years long, the the, ta the trial. Yeah. And yeah. they compared all the different species that were hardy in that region. Mm -hmm. um, and they evaluated them for various uh, traits and so forth. Could you walk on them and so forth? But now, now that the, the, the original part of the trial is done, they left them in place and they're now mowing them 
and All walking right. on the moor and so forth to really yeah. learn which ones can have a look that's acceptable and also stand up to it. So right. I think we're going to get more information. Pennsylvania is, I don't think, necessarily the one that's going to be the one to mow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because some of them that get longer and looser, it, mm -hmm. when you cut them off, there's a lot of bear around each clump. Yes, you yes. know, it's like a crown and nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't have that thick look. No, so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that's a great place to look and it's on their website. Yeah. Mount Cuba Center's website, the whole Carrick's report, and yeah. it talks about which ones they think are going to have the most possibility as a walkable ground cover and potentially. Yeah, we, we must get um, Mount, somebody from Mount Cuba in, actually. Mm -hmm. Sam, Sam Hoadley. Yeah, Sam, Sam, Sam Hoadley is great. Mm -hmm. he, he runs the trial program. Oh, that's right. Yes, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a question from Sara De Angelis. Yeah. So she's saying, Margaret, could you speak about how you think about your garden and four season interests? So I, I guess it's how you how you think about your garden through the four seasons, I suppose, and, and maybe highlight yeah. that. Yeah, I, I, I do think that's a good question because I think of it as sort of my mandate is like the 365 day garden. I said before I'm in a, a winter, an area where we have a, a cold and a long winter. And I also mentioned before, even though I showed a picture of like looking out over the patio, I never sit in the furniture outside and do any of that. I see the garden hey, from the side. Oh, I think somebody's got their, their uh, mute. Oh, okay, I've just muted somebody. Yeah, could you just make sure you've all got your microphones turned off? Sorry, Margaret. That's okay. Yeah. Um. So, I see the garden, you know, kind of from inside out is how I appreciate it. Um, more times that because when I'm outside, I'm working in it, right? I'm doing a chore, right? I'm weeding, I'm edging. Um, so I think that the 365 day approach begins with go inside and look out the window. By that, I mean, look out the key windows that you view from as the homeowner, you know, as the resident, right? Um, is there a, a, a place where you, you know, sit and eat every day and it looks out that away? Make an axial view from there, make a picture from there. Like, I think that's, I don't think I can, with 2.3 acres, have every inch of it looking good 365 days a year, right? But I can make moments that suit where I'm going to view it from and and so forth, you know. Mm -hmm. So so that was how I began um, is, you know, I placed a lot of those big fruiting um, shrubberies on axis from where I sat in the winter so that I could enjoy the fruit until the birds took it and the birds while they were here taking it, right? Mm -hmm. That I had a view of it. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, <clears throat> but I think it's very, very important to sort of also when you shop for plants, think kind of early, middle, late, like even if you're, um, we were talking about Narcissus before we began the actual class today, um, you know, if you're shopping for Narcissus, don't just shop for one kind of Narcissus, right? Mm -hmm. Even here where I am, we could have easily 10 weeks of, of Narcissus, right? Yeah, yeah. If we, and, and so in, in that, if we extrapolate from there, that's a simple example. Um, if I'm interested in fruit for the birds, is there some fruit that comes early? Is there some fruit that comes in the middle of the season in high summer? Is there some fruit that comes in the fall? make a fruit story for as long as I can in the year. Mm -hmm. What are, if I like pink, what's early pink, what's middle pink, what's late pink? Do you know what I mean? I mean, that's my yeah. very simplistic, non-professional way of thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose, um, have you got a particularly favorite season or is, is it just, you know, there's favorite things in each season for you? How, how do you, how do you, act, you know, inter interact with the garden in, in the different seasons? Well, mostly, as I said, I'm just looking out the window at it <laughs> or working, working in it. Yeah, yeah, head um, down. Yeah. yeah, there are definitely favorite things in each season. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, I think, but, I think, 
Yeah. Sorry. sorry. I, was say, I think the garden is a great marker of time. I mean, I was just taking photographs today of buds swelling on a, a little prunus. And, you know, it is it it, it is that wonderful thing that I, I feel that, ah, oh, you know, it's it's that time. It doesn't have to necessarily be a particular month or time of the month, but it, it's a sort of, ah, oh, now it, now the viburnum buds are, are building. So that you really do. Yes. Yes. You know, every year you you see those markers come along, and 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 some of them have gone, and you think, oh well, that's going to you know wait for another year. But I think that's a wonderful thing in the garden that you do have this brilliant sort of calendar. If 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 you're clever at choosing a good seasonal structure and and a good spread, then you know, yeah, you do and have I, this wonderful I, calendar. I'm not much of a by comparison. The balance of my plants were not chosen for their flowers. They were chosen mm -hmm. for their leaves. I'm definitely more of a foliage mm -hmm. person and structure person. Mm -hmm. And that really helps to have a 365 day garden if you or a longer season of interest, if you pick for foliage and structure. Yeah. So I can be, a, you know, I have a lot of plants that do many more months of service than a flowering mm -hmm. plant could possibly do. You know? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, or or yeah, then a plant chosen for its flowers could yeah. possibly do. Yeah, um, Mary Mary Ellen is asking, can we repeat the names of the estate utilizing native plants? Well, we talked about Mount Cuba, but we also talked about Stoneley, um, two two very different gardens, but not very far away from each other. In fact, but um, right, uh, Stoneley is not very far away from Chanticleer, um, and and is, I'd say, yeah, it's 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 really um it's not what you expect i went there thinking oh you know it's mm. going to be you know i had i had in my mind a vision of a, a garden of native plants and it was just so exciting and what ethan's doing is very unusual and um, experimental yeah 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 so no it's good to see that um that's great well it's been wonderful having you as a guest i think we've oh. been very lucky and we've we've uh, we've covered, obviously covered a lot of ground yes lots of ground and 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 there's lots of lots of wonderful comments we'll we'll copy them and send them to you margaret okay. so many lovely comments but lots of people are saying how wonderful your blog is um and and there's something your online garden club with ken Drews is wonderful as well so um you've obviously got a good fan base in tonight so there <laughs> oh thank you very much that's yeah, very sweet yeah 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 if you stick okay. around long enough you cultivate fans yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great no we feel very very honored to have you yes, as a guest yes, yes, oh, lovely lovely, yeah, lovely. Yeah, yeah yeah great right. Good. thank you so much well thank well, you very much and yes. thanks everybody for joining us and to do um, do call by again on a on yes a do night. we've got plenty to offer we've got hundreds of hours of, of, of viewing uh so uh so do, impressive do, so impressive yeah. yeah oh thank you well it's fun it's fun i mean i think noel and i enjoy it immensely but but it yeah, but it is yeah. great fun connecting people and uh yeah it makes the world feel smaller which is nice especially at this time of year yes yeah definitely okay well listen we'll see you all on next thursday hopefully and margaret thanks again it's been thank lovely you. having you yeah, take thank care you, thank you bye all right bye bye bye, bye.